Coming up on Network Africa. Nigeria's President Bola Tinumbu arrives Equatorial Guinea on a three-day official visit. The United Nations says over 700,000 people affected by floods in Central and West Africa region. Plus, Ugandan court convicts LRA commander Thomas Koyelo of crimes against humanity between 1992 and 2005. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olaride. Nigeria's president Bola Tinumbu has arrived in Malabo, the capital of Equatorial Guinea, for a three-day official visit. The president was received by the Equatorial Guinea Prime Minister Manuela Roca Bote this afternoon. His visit is on the invitation of his counterpart, President Teodoro Mbasogo. The private meeting between the two presidents will be followed by signing of bilateral agreements focusing on various areas, including oil and gas, security and others. President Tinumbu is expected to sign a historic visitor's book after which a press statement would be made available. Back here in the country, Nordic ministers are urging Nigeria uh, to continue along the path of democracy as it seeks to deepen trade ties between the countries. In a joint maiden visit to Nigeria, a delegation from the Nordic countries, including Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Norway, as well as Denmark, noted that countering violent extremists in West Africa and achieving sustainable development goals is among areas of special focus. Well, during the visit, the Finnish minister also spoke on ongoing actions by the government over complaints against Nigerian Finnish citizen Simon Ekwa. Our correspondent, Gloria Umezioke, reports. <laughs> It's a joint visit of five Nordic ministers to Nigeria who, for the first time, have converged to reinforce trade partnerships with Nigeria, with whom it shared 60 years of strong traditions. And, uh... In a media conference, the need to address global challenges and insecurity from a mutually beneficial standpoint is another point, as the ministers restate their objectives. In the Nordics, we attach special focus on the concept of trust. Increasing trade and investment is a high priority for both Nigeria and us, the Nordics. Finland and Finnish companies have a lot to offer, like expertise and innovative solutions in digitalization, energy, the circular economy, education, health, to name a few. For Iceland, in the Nigeria is the 15th biggest importer, um, and that is mainly, almost only, uh, in fish. Um, but we have many other opportunities in, uh, in other fields, and especially when it comes to a very growing population. The Finnish minister also disclosed actions by the government against Simon Epa's case. Both our judicial systems do collaborate on this matter, and we hope that uh, we will be able to close it uh, soon. Boosting renewable energy between the Nordic countries and Nigeria is another area of focus, particularly for the Norwegian and Icelandic governments. So sending our uh, people from the ministry or from, uh, from the energy sector in Norway to come and work with counterparts here to share that knowledge and help build uh, that sector in the renewable energy sector. But the national ownership of your energy uh, sources is something that we uh, also emphasize. In an exclusive interview with Chad television, however, ministers of Sweden and Denmark illuminate security as top priority. We see with uh, growing anxiety what's going on in, in West Africa and the problems which you are facing. And we believe that we have a responsibility to help out and to support Nigeria and other democratic states who don't want to see a slide back into the authoritarian rule, which we thought that we have left behind. For 20 years, we have seen a steady progress and Nigeria is an excellent example of a democratic nation. We should build on that. Uh, we have uh, supported the African Union and its important role in peace and stability in the 
region and we have uh, supported peace and stability through uh, the European uh, Union um, as well. So we are looking at what we can do more, how we can uh, help uh, Nigeria and other countries in the region uh, to better uh, to, to create uh, a better uh, situation. The Nordic ministers who were looking to deepen relations on the African continent continue their two-day trip in Ghana. From Abuja, Gloria Umezuki, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Tuga, has been discussing ways Nigeria can strengthen ties with the Nordic countries. The conversations have been going on with ministers from Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Norway and Denmark, as well as representatives from Norway and Denmark in Abuja. The discussion focused on Half deepening the, the long-standing relationship between Nigeria and the Nordic countries, which dates back to Nigeria's independence why we have the four Ds, democracy, development, demo demography, and diaspora, um, which I will uh, you know, expand on uh, a bit later. The eight-point agenda of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, as you can see, has quite uh, a bit of overlap with the uh, SDGs, which I know uh, all the countries here present um, have been supporting strongly uh, in terms of implementation and of course the good work that all the countries have been doing uh, in the Lake Chad region is something that is not unnoticed by Nigeria and it's something that we, uh, we really appreciate and that we uh, treasure. Uh, we're looking to engage to learn uh, so much from all the countries um, because the Nordic region is one that excels in terms of the circular economy. This is something that uh, we feel we can do a lot uh, uh, together. Um, the, your triple helix is something also that uh, uh, we're monitoring we're, and admiring uh, from a distance and we want to uh, see how we can uh, benefit from that uh, mutually. And um, there are several other areas that, um, you know, I think we can delve uh, further into. To the impact of flooding across Central and Western Africa, the UN's Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says over 700,000 people are being affected by floods currently. Deputy spokesperson for the UN Secretary General, Fahan Haq, says the situation is the result of torrential rains that have hit the region just two months into the rainy season. Those affected span across nine countries in the region. In response to the scale of the disaster, the United Nations, in collaboration with its partners, say it has intensified support to the governments of the affected countries and the assistance provides the food, shelter, water and sanitation services. Of humanitarian affairs is concerned about flooding in the region, which has already affected hundreds of thousands of people. Just two months into the rainy season, torrential rains and severe flooding have impacted more than 700,000 people in the Central African Republic, Chad, Côte d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Liberia, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, and Togo. The UN and our partners are supporting the responses by governments of the region including with the distribution of food, shelter, and water and sanitation assistance. This year, the Central Emergency Response Fund allocated $10 million to Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Niger to respond to emergencies related to climate shocks, including floods. To East Africa now, where a Ugandan court has found Thomas Koyelo, the commander of the feared Lord's Resistance Army, guilty of multiple counts of crimes against humanity. He is the only LRA commander to be tried in the East African country. At the International Crimes Division, ICD, of the High Court in the northern city of Gulu, where the LRA was once active, lead judge Michael Lubu says he is found guilty of the 44 offenses and hereby convicted. His offenses include murder, rape, torture, 
pillaging, abduction and destruction of settlements for internally displaced people. It is the first atrocity case to be tried under a special division of the High Court that focuses on international crimes. Coyello, who was abducted by the LRA at the age of 12, had denied all the charges against him. Let's speak now to the VOA's Halima Atumani in Kampala. Hello, Halima. Great to see you. Thank you for your time. Hi, Naomi. Thank you for having me. Well, can you give us a bit of perspective on the person Thomas Coyello and his role in the LRA back when these atrocities uh, were committed? You just mentioned that uh, Coelho was abducted at the age of 12. Some argue he probably was abducted at the age of 13 and he grew through the ranks. He's not the, he was not among the top ethelion of the Lord's Resistance Army, but he definitely got himself to the position of colonel. And while as a colonel, he had his own best. Um, and, and, and I think for most people, he, he was the one in charge. Yesterday when I was speaking to victims, I said he was the one in charge of the sick bay, okay, uh, in a place called uh, Kilak Hills. That was where his base was. Uh, and, and and during his operations, he he was in charge of very many things. He, you know, was in charge of, of pillaging. He was in charge of, you know, going to loot people's homes, people's gardens, people's uh, animals. Uh, as he grew through the ranks, he became responsible, for example, for, you know, finding wives for the for the generals, for the commanders in charge. So he did quite a lot. And I think for most people yesterday, they came in because when I spoke to them, they said we were under the Koyelo camp, literally meaning the area that was under Koyelo was where most of the victims that attended court yesterday were, were stayed or, or lived. And, you know, you just spoke about the victims. How are Ugandans reacting to uh, this judgment? I mean, the LRA was a feared, was a feared and notorious group. You know, it, I think for me, when I when I spoke to some victims, because I was in court yesterday, it was a bag of mixed feelings. Some were happy. Uh, they were happy that there was justice, right? They were happy that someone is being held accountable. But victims are torn. They think that it's, it should not be just the LRA who are being held accountable, even the, even the government itself. A lady I spoke to said on the night that they were ad uh, abducted, they literally walked, and she said, we walked peacefully. We passed uh, an army barracks. If, if they knew that the LRA had entered our village and were abducting people, that was the point for them to stop the abduction from happening. But it didn't. She was only 10 years old at this point. And they took them away. So for, for many of them, yes, there's someone being held accountable, but they think more people need to be held accountable. Uh, on the other hand, I think there was one thing there was one thing that that was on the mind of many of these victims. And I think maybe hopefully for your last question, I will probably look at that. But for many of these victims, the issue is reparation. Who is going to compensate us? Who is going to give us what we want? Because, you know, after Dominic Wentz ruling on the ICC, many of them lost hope. And I think yesterday when I was speaking to them, they were saying, if the whole of the ICC say he does not have money, to pay victims whose lives were affected by what Dominic Wen did. What about Coelho, who, is, who has nothing? You know, I'm also curious, Halima, as to why uh, it said that he's the only commander to be tried in Uganda. Well, you know, when Dominic Wen was arrested, his arrest came much earlier. Uganda had not yet set up the International Crimes Division. And this was a court that was set up in 2008, you know, to be able to try both national and international cases. So by the time Thomas Coelho was arrested, this court had been set up. So the government uh, decided it will handle its own case. But also, I think that was also the time when most African countries, you know, had issues with the ICC. And I think many of them decided to set up their own uh, local local courts, but give them a mandate just as much as you would see the ICC trying cases, you know, that cross borders. Remember that 
the LRA has been operating or was operating within, you know, Uganda, South Sudan, the CAR, so and and some parts of DRC. So all these countries, you know, eventually when these cases come up, these countries are going to be mentioned, which was the same thing with Poyole yesterday in court. They kept making reference to, you know, the atrocities that he also committed uh, or were committed under his command while in South Sudan. So the ICD then gets the opportunity to try Coelho as the first because the other the other commanders we're still not sure. All right, but then, in case Halima. they were to be arrested now, they would definitely be uh, also tried under the ICD. All right, we'll see how you know it all pans out in the coming days. But thank you so much, Halima Atumani, a Ugandan journalist with the VOA. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Well, Ethiopia and Somalia have made notable progress in efforts to settle a dispute sparked by Ethiopia's deal with the breakaway region of Somaliland. At the end of a second round of talks, the mediator, Turkey, made this known with the foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, saying that the issues discussed significantly increased compared to the first round of talks and that a collaborative and constructive solution is within reach. Mr. Fidan adds that a third round of talks would be held in September. Tensions between the two African countries have simmered since Ethiopia signed an MOU with Somaliland in January, which Somalia denounced as infringing upon its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Let's take a break now on the program still to come. It's been a party in Botswana, Egypt and Kenya where fans... Welcome their Olympic team. Please join us again. Welcome back to the program. Here in Lagos, wife of the state governor, Dr. Ibijoke Somolu, has flagged off the 2024 maternal newborn child and adolescent health plus nutrition week at the Lagos Island East Local Go Council Development Area. Now, at the event, Dr. Songo Lu explained that the MNCAH plus N week remains a symbolic event in Lagos, serving as a reminder that good health practices are essential to longevity and that the survival of a child is closely tied to adequate nutrition. It's the 2024 flag of ceremony of the maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health plus nutrition week in Lagos State. The statewide initiative has brought together health workers, nursing mothers to Lagos Island East Local Council Development Area to benefit from the exercise. <laughs> nursing mothers and attendants have the opportunity to benefit from the free medical health services, which remains open beyond the week-long exercise. We want to make sure that people who haven't had immunization get access to immunization. People that haven't had uh, proper nutrition screening get access to nutrition screening and to nutritional supplements if there's any problem with their the development. And also that mothers get access to good education about uh, their pregnancy. We observe that better me, hey, some of our children at that young age, between the old zero age to five years old age, did not take their better me hey, and cause a lot of havoc for the children. But today, our mother have said it, the first lady of Lagos State, and is trying to come out enlightening people and telling the people of Lagos, from Lagos allies to the entire Lagos State, that vitamin A is a very important part for the mothers to take for the children. The wife of the Lagos State Governor, Dr. Ibijoke Sawolu, joined senior officials from the State Ministry of Health to create awareness on routine immunization, malnutrition screening, deworming, among others. The MNCAH plus N week will also provide a golden opportunity for all children under the age of five years to be screened and receive knowledge on food varieties that can be combined for improved nutrients. I appeal to us here to be an ambassador for each other by encouraging the caregivers of any malnourished child we see to come to our health facilities during and even after this week. Dr. Sawolu advocates exclusive breastfeeding and also speaks against domestic and sexual violence. That's why our efforts in keeping our children alive we have the infant mortality 
or 47 per 1,000 live births. Under five children, mortality rate is 59 per 1,000 live births. We encourage our mothers to please exclusively breastfeed our children. The Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health Plus Nutrition Week is targeted at reaching over 5 million children under the age of 5 with essential services to help reduce maternal and child mortality rate in Lagos State. To politics now in Libya, the House of Representatives has voted to end the term of the Government of National Unity led by Abdul Hamid Bebe. The House of Representatives also deemed Osama Hamad's government of national stability as the legitimate leadership until a unified administration is selected. During a session held in Benghazi, the House of Representatives, chaired by Agula Saleh, voted to recognize Hamad as the supreme commander of the army under his chairmanship of the House. Osale is calling on lawmakers now to achieve reconciliation and form an authority of local governance and end centralization in Libya. He's also suggesting that Libya should be divided into three regions as, according to him, it is the only solution to solve the crisis in the country and end the clashes so that Libyans can enjoy equal rights. The Libyan national reconciliation process has stalled after several parties withdrew from it, including the Libyan army, the presidential council chairman, Mohamed Al-Manfi, and representatives of al-Islam Gaddafi. Well, Libya has been in a state of political instability since the fall of the late leader, Muammar Gaddafi's regime, in 2011, after ruling the country for more than four decades. Well, Tuesday was the Central African Republic's Independence Day celebration and there was a military parade in the capital, Bangui, to mark the 64th anniversary of the country's proclamation of independence from France in 1960. CAR troops in various uniforms with numerous detachments marched at the parade in the country's capital. President Faustin Ashange Touadera and other senior officials also attended the ceremony. France seized the colonized Ubangi Shari in 1894, which included the territory of today's CAR. In 1946, Barthélemy Boganda was elected as the first representative of the CAR to the French government. Boganda returned to the Central African Republic in 1950 to create the movement for the social evolution of Black Africa. He was then elected president of the Grand Council of French Equatorial Africa in a landslide election in 1957, launching the country towards its independence three years later. And now to after the Olympics, it's been a party for athletes returning home from Paris as fans put up a hero's welcome for them. In Botswana, tens of thousands of people packed the stadium to welcome their sprinter, Lestile Tebogo, who won the country's first ever Olympic gold medal. Captura supporters waved the country's blue and black national flag as the Olympic team touched down in the capital, Gaborone. The athletes paraded around the national stadium on a rooftop bus waving at fans, enjoying a half-day holiday that was declared by the president to celebrate Tabogo's success. With this gold medal, 21-year-old Tabogo is also the first African to win the men's 200-meter race, setting an African record time of 19.46 seconds. And along with his teammates, he gained a silver in the men's 4x400 meter relay, boosting Botswana's total Olympic medal tally to four.
Kenyan fans came out in their numbers to welcome their runners, Faith Kipyo, Kipyegon and Beatrice Chibet, as they arrived at the airport in Nairobi. With singing and dancing, locals in traditional attire put on a show for the medalists. Other supporters met with the Kenyan runners with flowers and hugging them, and the athletes were also taking pictures with their fans outside the airport. Both ladies secured three golds and one silver at the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris. Kipyegon, a middle distance runner, won silver in 5,000 meters and also set a world record in 1,500 meters. Beatrice Chibet, a long distance runner, won two gold medals in 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters. The African continent won a total of 38 medals at the Paris 2024 Olympics, with Kenya leading the African medal tally with 11 medals. My biggest goal is to defend my title over the 1500 and make history. And I really thank God I could come out after frustration and disappointments over 5000. I can't say it was disappointment, but it was a little bit traumatic, you know, to have won silver and given a DQ without your, your like, what did I do, you know? And then I, it took a lot of um, energy on me. It took a lot of like, uh, I don't know. I still don't know how to say it. It's still, it's still emotional because it was really, really emotional to me. I don't know how I came out and still perform how I perform in 1500 and makes history. But um, I really thank all the people who supported me to have stand uh, on that podium being the greatest 1500 meter um, of all time and knowing that you are, I have inspired many young girls out there, next generation. It was a big achievement for me. And you know, I think I've been inspiration to many young girls. This is my first time. Over in Egypt, sport fans welcomed their Olympic heroes home to Cairo after the team won three medals, gold, silver and bronze at the Paris Games. Fans holding banners, singing and dancing welcomed the team as they arrived Cairo International Airport. Ahmed El Gendi took gold in the modern pentathlon and weightlifter Sarah Samir was the silver medalist in the 81 kg category. Egypt's third medal, a bronze in the fencing, was won by 21-year-old Mohamed El Sayed. And that's all we have for you today on Network Africa. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarindi.